Welcome to the Brainstorm episode 77. We've got Nick, Varshka, and Tasha. We're talking YouTube, TikTok, buying things online from videos, and a, a crowd pleaser, uh, Tesla, and what Nick thinks about autonomous. First, we're going to kick it off with Varshka and live streaming commerce. What's going on there? Welcome to episode 77 of the Brainstorm. All right. Thank you guys for having me. So, um, Sam, I don't know if you've actually, uh, do you use like platforms like TikTok, um, Instagram, YouTube? For um, I'm a, I'm a YouTube Instagram guy. No, okay. t- no didn't, didn't, I, I've stayed away from a uh, TikTok pre I've tried, I've tried <laughs> to get them on. Okay. So what I'm hearing is you do use like video centric social platforms. And as of estimates as of this year is that in the U S there's going to be more like users of these video for social networks than there are of linear TV viewers. And I think what that speaks to is a trend where fundamentally people are getting their primary source of entertainment from these like, you know, video for social media. I'm like a great example. Even if something's on TV, I'm always just scrolling through my phone because that's just easy entertainment in the palm of my hand. Right. So, um, Now, we think of it as, oh, like you're just doom scrolling, like this is such a waste of time. But in reality, it is a huge opportunity for brands to sell products to you. And that's what live stream commerce is. So is there a uh, QVC of live stream? I know in China, certainly. But, you know, the question I have is this is switching over. But are the old people who buy stuff on linear TV still dominating the spend or is spend also shifting. I imagine it lags views, but. Well, yeah. So I think QVC is like a great example, I think. And that's also why I feel like this format is not foreign to both like older users as well. It's exactly the concept of QVC. You like, you know, sell something on like a, on like a, like, you know, video platform in a bit of an entertaining way. And then you get people to like make purchases like almost immediately, right? It's the exact same concept, except instead of selling like on a linear T or cable TV, because viewership there is dwindling, all of those viewers are switching over to these social networks. So that's where you should do this exact same format and repackage it up and have conduct these live streams. I think, uh, if, is there like a QVC equivalent? I think TikTok shop is definitely like a huge uh, a contender, especially in uh, the US and China as well. It's called Doyen over there. Uh, I think within the US, uh, you have a TikTok shop is the largest. Then I think you have YouTube and Facebook and Instagram that are pretty much like the biggest competitors. And then you also have these newer platforms like whatnot that are pretty much live stream only platforms. And they specialize in um collectibles and all these like really really niche markets so yeah i think it's a super interesting time we've been following the live stream commerce space for a while since really 2019 was when we first did work on it and you've resurfaced it here and i think you know you're now starting to see it finally take off in the west in the u.s partly because tiktok has put a ton of money into it and uh we've had now the copycats come along in, in terms of Instagram reels, I I think, you know, we're going to continue to see mass adoption here. Varshka, you have the numbers in our forecast. I'd love for you to talk those over because I think this market is going to be in the trillions as you look out to the future. Primarily, if you just grow China at what it has been, you're talking about enormous uh, amounts of spend happening through live stream commerce. And this goes back to something we talk about all the time, which is convergence, having these social platforms, which have massive distribution, QVC, H. HSN, those networks were reaching, you know, only the U.S. markets for the most part. And it was during a certain select hour. And, you know, it was very limited in what you could do as a seller. You also had to vet and, you know, get approved to go on there. Um, you had to, to, to get vetted and approved to go on there. This is anyone can go and sell whatever they want to anyone in the world, which I think is just tremendously powerful from an entrepreneurial perspective. 
So I can kind of just jump into the current state of what uh, the market is like in both China and the US. So I think in China, eMarketer estimates that um, live stream commerce is currently an impressive $900 billion market. So that is huge. Compared to that in the US, it's only a $50 billion uh, dollar market. But we project that um, as of uh, 2030, we think globally, live stream commerce can be a $3.7 trillion opportunity with China leading the charge at uh, 2.4 and uh, the U.S. scaling up to around $680 billion. Right. So these are massive markets. China alone, you know, you're talking about an enormous sum. And now with the U.S. finally starting to catch on, I mean, these are massive tailwinds for social media companies. If you think about Instagram and what Meta has in that asset alone, that is huge revenue if they're able to collect some sort of fee or, you know, drive advertising dollars on this select business. Um, I, I, I think this is massively misunderstood by the market and truly underappreciated when you look at some of these names, um, Meta being the primary one because it does have massive distribution in Instagram. And that really hasn't caught up to where TikTok is in terms of commerce and selling and, and live the live component as well. So I think this is something to definitely watch into 2025 as these enormous platforms begin to really monetize this, you know, this opportunity. It does seem like another example of uh, distribution being key, obviously very different than the uh, AI aspect, but certainly the network effects for commerce here. Yeah, that's power of scale playing out. Awesome. Varshka, thank you so much for, for joining us. And thank you to everyone who's uh, watching Sun on YouTube. Maybe you go buy some stuff. <laughs> thank you for having me. All right. Tasha, thank you for joining us. Last week, Tesla's earnings calls. Exciting, as always. A lot of people very excited coming off the call. Uh, not included in that group would be most traditional financial analysts, uh, but retail investors and uh, people on X. So can you kind of break down why such a big divide between TradFi uh, and everyone else and what you took away from the call? Sure. So overall, um, even though the results missed expectations, we saw the stock appreciate. And it seems like it's largely um, because of, of what we've been excited about over the past five to 10 years, which is the really, we should call it the AI opportunity now, but it's kind of all encompassing. It's, it's autonomous driving. It's then moving on to humanoid robots um, you know, originally it was Tesla as a software company versus just an automaker. Um, so the narratives evolved a bit, but, uh, you know, Elon and the executive team have been very focused on launching autonomous ride hail. And we got more detail on the call. Um, so we heard that they had, they plan to launch in Austin, uh, in June this year. So that's pretty huge. So, Nick, I know your opinion has changed about this in the past, say, nine minutes. But <laughs> <laughs> what what do you think? You know, e Elon said it before, uh, you know, we're going to launch commercially. We're going to launch. We're going to launch. Now he's saying June, Austin, RoboTaxi. Um, what's your take? Yeah, I'm glad you asked my take considering you two are the experts i feel like i should be asking both of you but uh, you know and hearing the work you guys have done obviously i think robo taxi is a huge business long term i think i'm probably less optimistic in terms of the timeline to reach scale than maybe you know you two but i don't follow the company as closely so i defer to the experts here but I, like i still have I, and i brought it up on this show before like i have questions around you know how do you change over the cars how do you charge them like it's an entirely different vehicle platform you need to work out the kinks so like in terms of reaching scale having it be a meaningful business especially when you're going to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with waymo and some of the other competitors like there's probably more questions for me than for you two but again you cover the name i just sit here and, and listen to to you two for the most part nice. especially backing off <laughs> Backing off. 
<laughs> See, I would, for the viewers, what they're not seeing is I'm being strong armed behind the scenes to come off as a major bear so that the views on this show go up. But I stand on my integrity of, you know, I have questions, but I'm not. You All know, right. I think it's so going Nick, to happen. Nick, lob the questions in and we'll we'll help it. We'll help address them. Well, actually, I have, I, have, I have a comment based on something that, that Nick said, which is I think that scale is a really interesting point here um, because the way that Tesla scales is just is really different than how Waymo scales. And, and that that I think should be discussed. So, OK. Oh, right, yeah. yeah. So maybe this is where I defer as a so my one, you know, I guess. I do own a Tesla, right? And this idea that I'm going to opt my car into the network, I personally would probably not, unless there was something that was like truly meaningful. And I, I still have quite like, there are little things that I just can't get pat. Like, how is the car going to open up my garage? How is it going to charge? Like, there's things that to me still seem like hurdles. Like, in the grand scheme of things, they're obviously very little, right? Like, you can fix all of this. But I think it still takes time to fix. That's why, like, the time period and, and the scale question to me is, like, there's kinks and, and hurdles you need to work out. As small as they may seem, it does take time to work those out and to, to convince people to hand over their car. Um, All right. Well, we're coming to Florida to show you how your Tesla can already open up your garage. Um, but <laughs> I will say that, uh, so you're, t this is, you're touching on even another point. So the, it's like, will they scale with customer cars? So they actually focused on the call on their internal fleet, which is how they plan to launch ride hail at first. Um, and we do believe that, you know, in the early days, uh, Tesla will own and operate the fleet. They're going to, they have set, they've signaled and said that over the long term they're going to maintain some sort of small fleet. And then, um, you know, they're incentivizing third parties, other companies to um, basically buy Tesla's, put them on the network. But that doesn't necessarily mean that they're relying on today's customers to do that. This could be this is like a business opportunity for third party companies. Um, the, the part of scale that I was going to touch on is slightly tangential to that, which is um, the way that Tesla scales is fundamentally different. So, so Elon said that, okay, they're planning on launching Austin this year. Um, you know, many cities, hopefully by the end of the year, they'll have unsupervised activity. So that means that basically like FSD, uh, full autonomy works. That's what unsupervised means. You don't have to monitor it as a driver. Um, and then nationwide next year. I mean, next year is when you as a customer would be able to sign your vehicle up for the platform. Gotcha. Um, but what does that actually mean? That That's, that's a, a capability uh, point, meaning that the software works in these geographies. So then it's like for Tesla, Launching becomes really more of like a logistics problem, which isn't nothing. I mean, you have to get a groundswell in cities. Um, you know, you have to get people to use the app, um, get on the platform, customer acquisition, all of that. There's probably some local regulation, even if autonomy moves um, to the federal level for regulation overall, um, some local ride hill regulation. But um, it's different than what Waymo does because for Waymo, they face when they expand it's both that logistics challenge and a technology challenge because they actually have to say, okay, now we're going to put cars in this area, start testing it. We're going to start putting cars on highways as they've done recently, for instance, start testing, um, you know, driver free, and then we'll launch. Whereas Tesla is like already doing all that R and D work with customers. Um, so at least like from a software perspective, the launch, is a lot more seamless in the scale. Um, you can imagine, you can you can see how because of that format that again, like scaling for them is just a, is it they already have one step solved. They they only have to do this sort of like um, you know business logistics management step. And on the logistics side, Tesla also released a video of the uh, or more video of the cleaning robot uh, to be implemented. And I think you know this is like a classic one of those, oh, but have you thought about how they're going to clean the cars? And it's like, if they clean these cars with a robot once a year, almost certainly cleaner than a taxi cab <laughs> that you... What taxi cabs are you driving in that you think they're that dirty? Um, I, I'm telling you... I think you're, you you may be pricing yourself into... I was, the, in, the I was in, in an Uber in... That's a crazy thing. Western... <laughs> 
in I will not let you get away with that. I, I was in a Uber in Florida, and an ant fell on my head from the an roof ant? of the car. Yes, you've and never was, been. We were on a highway. I couldn't get out. I couldn't I'm, get out. I'm totally on Sam's side. Like especially once a year. All right, we're going to clean it. They're going to clean it. Regulations over cleaning. Yeah. They can do whatever. Well, I understand that. I understand that. But, but I'm saying year. Tesla cars are going to be far cleaner than the average Uber or taxi cab that you get into. And on the robotic side, right? Another exciting point of the call. A lot of talk on Optimus. You know, we're far more conservative than Elon is um, on the ramp. Uh, but he said, you know, they're. Internal ambitious goal is roughly 10,000 robots by the end of this year. So maybe they get to a few thousand or half of that uh, if they come up short. And then kind of scaling an order of magnitude per year after that. Uh, although, you know, also noting that a humanoid robot is a thousand times harder than the autonomous vehicle. Uh, but what makes it all possible is really the learnings. This real world AI, and I think another thing that ties into the kind of mismatch in expectations from traditional finance and everyone on the technology side is there does seem to be a weird dynamic where everyone's very excited about AI and then can't kind of cross the bridge to real world AI. It's like everyone's so excited about deep seek and all of these models and then like can't go the one step further to be like, yes, this means that like, Robo taxi at scale is right around the corner. And I think to me, that's like one of the most visceral disconnects in the market right now. Well, it could, it could be different companies that are, you know, the, the companies of today that are great at software based AI may not be great at real world AI. And I think, I think that from an investor perspective, it's, um, it's, it's perceived as more risky because because it's hardware based, like it becomes, you know, also a capital in, in intensive endeavor. Um, of course, if you're a company like Tesla, that's you know less of an issue. Right. Um, because they have cash that's coming off their um, electric vehicle line. And they were, you know, smartly like one of the first companies to be profitable on EVs. And now they can use that to build these other businesses. Not everyone has that that luxury. And one thing, you know, as I say this now and think about when we're recording this, our big idea is just published. So everyone should go download that or look at the X posts where people just post screenshots. Just kidding, Ben, who's listening as a producer. Everyone has to download it. You can't see it any other way. Uh, <laughs> Tasha has a great section on, on robo taxis. Um, and Nick and Varshka have a great section as well. Nick, you want to do a quick pitch of your section sure ai agents so all thing autonomous consumer uh facing we're you know talking about having a digital assistant in your pocket um how will that uh change the way we interact with the internet and our digital lives um incorporating ai agents into digital wallets uh being able to purchase and uh look across different marketplace in a flash. Um, I think we've, you know, talked about a lot of this. You, you, what you hear on this show is our initial thoughts and sometimes debates. Um, what goes into big ideas is the culmination of all of the conversation and research over the entire year. Um, also including that, uh, in, included in the AI agent section, you have uh, an enterprise component as well. So how is it going to impact the workplace? Are we as knowledge workers still going to have jobs in a few years? to be determined. Um, so we will uh, get, we get into all of that in the report. So it's, it's a, it's a fascinating report. There's so much else in there, genomics, Bitcoin, stable coins. Um, you got everything that we think is interesting, reusable rockets, Sam, you mean humanoid, guys, robots. humanoid robots, you guys have it all. So definitely a fun report to check out. It's how we think about the future of the world and how it's going to shape up in the next five, 10, 15 years. All right. Thanks Silence. everyone for joining us. That's good. Good. Yeah. You, you did. You did good. All right. Thank you everyone for joining us and we'll see you next week.